today's webinar um, on what's the big deal with microplastics. So hopefully you all are able to hear me. Um, if it's been a while since you used Adobe Connect, you can click on that link on your screen, <clears throat> excuse me, and it should run a test on your computer system and make sure that you have all of the add-ons and everything necessary to participate. If any issues come up um, throughout the webinar, your best bet is to log out and try logging back in. That usually fixes most problems. Uh, one other option you can try is on the top left-hand side of your screen, you should see a meetings menu bar, and you can click on that and do the audio setup wizard, and it'll walk you through a few steps to make sure your computer is set up uh, for the sound appropriately. So I did want to let you guys know that this webinar will be recorded and it's going to be available online. So we'll email you all the link as long as you registered for the webinar, you'll get the link uh, to the recording. And it's also to let you know if you see somebody in uh, the participant list that you want to chat with, uh, just know that the chat box on the bottom right hand side of your screen will also be included in that recording. So you do have an option to start private chats on the side if you click on the person's name. So if you don't want it to be recorded, you can you can do that. We will be answering questions throughout the webinar. Um, so when I'll be presenting, Maya will keep uh, an eye on the chat box so you can type your questions in. If she knows the answer, she'll just respond to you there. If there's a question that involves um, a longer response, we might wait till the end of the webinar. So we'll be keeping track of the chat box throughout the presentation. So with that, we're going to jump into the presentation. So I am Lara Milligan. I'm the natural resources agent for UF IFAS Extension in Pinellas County on the central west coast of Florida. And Dr. McGuire is also on the webinar. She is located uh, up in Flagler in St. John's County. She's the Sea Grant agent up there. So we'll be hearing from Maya halfway through the presentation. We'll transition over to her. So first thing I want to do is define what microplastics are to make sure we're all on the same page. And the best way to do that is to kind of break up this term. So looking at the Oxford Dictionary definition of plastics, which states here, you can read it on your screen, a synthetic material made from a wide range of organic polymers, such as polyethylene, PVC, nylon, etc., that can be molded into shape while soft and then set into a rigid or slightly elastic form. So when you put micro in front of that and get the term microplastics, now we're referring to plastics that are less than five millimeters in size. That's generally how microplastics are defined. So when we're talking about microplastics, we tend to categorize them into two main groups. So there's secondary microplastics and these are the result of larger plastic products breaking down over time. So they can photodegrade from UV light. Um, there can be chemical degradation, microbial degradation. So as these products break down over time and they get to that five millimeters size or smaller, we refer to those as secondary microplastics. And one of our uh, largest um, I guess threats of secondary microplastics are from synthetic fabrics. So when these fabrics that are made of things like polyester, nylon, acrylic, polypropylene, uh, when the fibers uh, shed, especially when we're doing laundry, so we throw our clothes in the washing machine, you know, it stirs it up real good, agitates the clothing, and some of those fibers will shed off. And when and they do that, they get sent to the wastewater treatment plant um, along with all of our other wastewater. And the issue is that the wastewater treatment plants are not designed to filter out these microscopic particles. You know, if we were to have to filter millions of gallons of water through the tiny filters necessary to trap these microplastics, uh, it just really wouldn't be feasible. It would get clogged up and it's just not an option at this time. So. That's one issue that we're facing is that they're not being removed from the wastewater treatment plants and then ultimately ending up in our water. And Maya will talk more about that later. Um, 
And there's also another term when it comes to these fibers in reference to secondary microplastics. And so if you see microfiber, that's when it's a combination of these fabrics, whether it's polyester, nylon, acrylic, or polypropylene. So those are kind of your alarming words that you should look for from here on out um, as a potential contributor to the secondary microplastic problem. Okay, so we're gonna ask you a couple poll questions throughout the presentation. This is our first one. Uh, since we just talked about secondary microplastics, which of the following would not contribute to the secondary microplastic problem? And you can go ahead and on your screen, click your response. So quick dry running shorts, plastic utensils, your favorite face jacket, or 100% cotton t-shirt. Okay, it looks like most folks have answered. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. I'll show you all the results. So yes, the correct answer is D, 100% cotton t-shirt. So cotton is a natural uh, fabric material, and so that would not be contributing to any type of microplastic problem since it's not considered a plastic. Um, quick dry running shorts. Uh, plastic utensils obviously made from plastic, and then fleece jackets are typically made of polyester, which would contribute to secondary microplastics. So, good job, everybody. So, the other category of microplastics is what we call primary microplastics, and within primary microplastics, we kind of break them up into a few categories one of which is what we call nurdles, which is a pretty fun word. Um, and nurdles are the pre-production resin pellets that the manufacturers use to make plastic items. So you can kind of see the pellets in the bottom right-hand side um, on the screen there. And so that's what they use to melt down and make uh, various plastic products. You can probably look around the room that you're in now and know that that's probably what they started off as. Um, and they can also be used as fillers for things like Beanie Babies, or sometimes you might have a squishy pillow. So nurdles are what those are referred to as. And then also within that primary microplastics group is this uh, term that we call microbeads. So this is often found in our personal care products, things like facial scrubs and body wash, anything that um, often has the word exfoliating on it. It's not always plastic, but um, sometimes they are. And when they are, we refer to those as microbeads. So this image here is through the shots through the microscope. And on the left is from a facial scrub. And on the top right is from toothpaste. So you can see those colorful microbeads are the plastic and um, well, I guess I'm, I'll jump ahead of myself, but um, you might be wondering, you know, why is there plastic in our personal care products? So there's a couple different, if you want to call them rumors, going around as to why uh, they're putting microbeads in our personal care products. One is for color and shine, so you can pretty much make plastic any color that you want. So in toothpaste, it might have that sparkling appearance to it, you know, it, which makes us think we might have these sparkly shiny teeth as we scrub them with tiny pieces of plastic. Um, others can be used as fillers for the product. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind. I already mentioned uh, with the micro fibers that they're not removed from the wastewater treatment plant and the same applies to micro beads. So anything that basically gets washed down our drain and ends up at the wastewater treatment plant is currently uh, not being intended uh, to be removed from the plant. So you can look on your personal care products. They have an ingredients list, just like if you look at nutrition labels um, on your food products or the ingredients list on your food products, you can get used to looking at your personal care products in the same way. And the word that you want to look for is polyethylene. So that's the main type of plastic that's used when it comes to microbeads. So you just want to keep an eye out for that when you're looking on the ingredients list. Now I will give a word of caution for things like toothpaste. 
often it comes in a, uh, a container and we take the tube of toothpaste out of the container, throw the container away, um, but the full list of ingredients is on what we threw away and the complete list of ingredients is not on the actual tube of toothpaste. So um, just want to be to caution you about that, but there is another option which I'll get to in a minute. You might have heard about the Microbead Free Waters Act of 2015 that President Obama signed, um, which obviously relates to this discussion of microbeads. Well, we shouldn't have to worry if this act was passed. Uh, the issue is that this only refers to wash off cosmetics that are used for um, cleansing and exfoliating. So there's things, it specifically states toothpaste in the act, but there's things like uh, deodorant and makeup that is not, could kind of be a loophole in uh, this act. So, and the act doesn't take effect until 2017, so products will no longer be able to be manufactured. Uh, if they contain microbeads, they can't manufacture them with the plastic anymore in 2017, and then they can no longer be sold in 2018. So it's a ways away. It's certainly a great step. Um, certainly brought a lot of awareness to the issue, but it's not the cure-all. So I mentioned one other way that you can tell if your personal care products contain microbeads or plastic in general is through this household products database. This is supported through the National Institutes of Health and you can click right on the link on your screen or you could do a search for it later on. But if you type in the word polyethylene in the quick search box on the top left when you're on the website and then you select the word polyethylene, it gives you this giant list of all the products in the database that contain polyethylene. It's a super long list. It's like six pages long. It starts with things like Ziploc bags that we would, of course, know are made of plastic. But then it gets into our personal care products, and there's everything from deodorant to foot cream to mascara, um, and the list goes on. It just has them all there. It lists the company name and is pretty specific as to what the product is. So you could see if what you have at home is on that list. So the next poll question is, have any of you ever checked your personal care products to see if they contain polyethylene? Okay, looks like most people have responded. Oh, a few more coming in. Okay, I'll go ahead and end it. So, it's, a, I wouldn't say half, half and half, but a good majority have, so that's good. And if not, I'm sure you will be now. Um, I know when I first learned about it, I was sorting through everything in my bathroom. Um, so, great job, everybody. I'll close that. And... Now is when I will transition the presentation over to Maya, and she will get more into kind of the science and research behind microplastics and tell you a little bit about our efforts here in Florida. So, Maya? All right. Thanks, Lara. So, moving on, you've learned what microplastics are, sort of where they come from. So what? Why are we concerned about this topic? Well, one thing that we know for sure is that they are pretty much everywhere. They're in the air, they're in the water, they're in the sediment. And from the research that's been being done over the last few years, it seems that the quantity of microplastics is increasing from year to year, which isn't really surprising, given that every piece of plastic ever made still exists. Our biggest concern with microplastics is the fact that they do not biodegrade. They may photodegrade or get broken apart physically, but they never revert back to the elements that they're made up from. So they're always around. In, we know that in the ocean, the surface of these plastics often gets covered with nasty toxic chemicals, things like PCBs, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, the DDT family of pesticides. Those compounds 
don't really like being in water and they find the surface of the plastic something that they can adsorb to and they can be found a million times more concentrated on the surface of a piece of plastic than they are in the water. We also know that these plastics are eaten by aquatic organisms, especially this has been studied in the marine environment. Everything from as small as plankton on up into larger organisms, uh, fishes, filter feeders like oysters uh, have all been, been studied. Uh, they've found microplastics in the digestive tracts of pretty much every organism that they've looked at in the ocean at this point. In addition to potentially having toxins on the surface of the plastic, the plastic itself has chemicals that are used when the plastics are manufactured. Things like phthalates, which are a, a plasticizer, so they're used to make the plastic flexible or more rigid. Uh, Phenol A, you've probably all heard of, that's that BPA that now our water bottles are labeled as being BPA free. Um, these chemicals will leach out of the plastic into organisms that either eat the plastic or are exposed to the plastic in their habitat. And the same is true for those adsorbed toxins on the surface of the plastics. But there is so much that we still don't know about microplastics. Uh, for example, we know all these organisms eat plastic, but then what happens next? Do they just excrete them? Do they become part of fecal pellets? Or does something else happen to them? Uh, it, what impact do the plastics themselves have on marine organisms? We have very few studies giving us any clues on that. I will touch on a couple that have been published recently. There's speculation about whether or not microplastics bioaccumulate up the food chain. That's something else we really don't have scientific evidence for. Um, and then the big question is, is there any impact on us? I don't know the answers to these questions. So I mentioned there have been a couple of studies published earlier this year uh, on the impact of plastics on organisms. I will mention right off the bat, these were both lab studies. They both involved polystyrene, so think styrofoam beads, and one was with Pacific oysters, so here's our, our oyster study. What they f did with this study was they had oysters that were fed plankton and oysters that were fed plankton to which plastics, little these little styrofoam polystyrene beads, had been added. And they looked at basically the impact on reproduction. So they looked at egg production, sperm production, or sperm motility. They looked at larval production and larval survival. And what they found was that the oysters that had the plastics included with their diet had lower egg production, lower sperm motility, less viable offspring, in other words, lower reproductive success. And what the authors speculated was that the animals have to put energy into clearing the plastics from their system or working the plastics through their system and therefore are not able to put as much energy into their reproductive effort as the control animals. So that's speculation, but that's kind of the conclusion that those researchers came up with. If you're interested in reading more about this study, it was published uh, in February in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, so it is available to, to find. Uh, you can always email me for the, the paper itself if you're interested. The other study that was published a little bit later on in the year, this one came out in June in Science. This study also involved polystyrene beads, also had control setup versus the experimental setup. The control setup just had plankton. The experimental set setup had polystyrene beads added to the plankton. They actually did a couple of different concentrations of polystyrene beads. And what they were doing was they started with fertilized fish eggs. They were using European perch, and they looked at how successful those eggs were at hatching, and then they also maintained the larvae in those different treatments for a period of time, and looked at their survival, and then after a couple of weeks, introduced little predators, and looked at how well the plastic-eating fish did compared to the controls. Similar to the oyster project, what they found was there did seem to be an energetic cost associated with the, the polystyrene and probably some sort of 
chemical association as well. Because what happened was the eggs that were exposed to the polystyrene beads had a lower hatch rate than the control eggs. The larvae, the, the young you know, juvenile fish in the polystyrene had lower activity rates. They swam less distance. They spent more time motionless compared to controls. And when predators were added, they used juvenile pike that they added into the, the tanks. The fish that had been exposed to microplastics had lower survival rates compared to controls. The fish raised with the microplastics were also smaller in size than the controls. In the high concentrations of plastic, we said they did different levels of, of microplastics in this experiment. So the fish that were exposed to the high concentrations basically seemed to just eat the plastic. Their stomachs contained exclusively plastic, while those in moderate microplastic water had both food and microplastics in their stomachs. So we don't really know why that is. Um, don't know if there was the, the sort of association that we have with larger organisms where if you eat too much plastic, your stomach tells your brain, I'm full, you don't need to eat anymore. Um, or if the fish were preferentially eating the plastics for some reason, we don't really know. But those were the findings that they had. So some of you have probably heard about this project. Uh, a young man named Boyan Slot, when he was 17 years old, about four years ago, gave a TEDx talk on how the oceans can clean themselves. And he has subsequently raised over $10 million for a uh, project to test his proposal. And his proposal was that if you used essentially a boom out in the ocean, you could use the circulation of the ocean itself to trap and corral plastics into a containment system, and that this would be uh, a way to remove plastics from the ocean. And he's currently testing a, a small-ish, 100-meter-long prototype in the North Sea. Uh, it was deployed in June. It'll be out there for a year. At least that's uh, They're going to see how well that works. So this got a lot of interest. It got a lot of interest from oceanists, most of whom are a little skeptical. Um, there are a lot of things that are not addressed in Slot's proposal. Um, he has done a feasibility paper, a quote-unquote study, looked at it. Um, it is available online. I'll let you, you know, draw your own conclusions. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this pilot project of his goes. But basically what all of the marine scientists are saying is that removing plastics from the ocean is not the answer. It's not going to be a bad thing if we can do it, but we need to stop putting so much plastic into the ocean. That's our big concern. One of the reasons that some folks are skeptical about SLAT's proposal is, is that a lot of these plastics, these microplastics that we're talking about today, are really, really small in size. So just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, the, the pictures at the bottom of this slide are from the filters that we are using with our citizen science project here in Florida. They have a grid on them. So the, the gray lines, the square that you can see in the, the center picture, that's three millimeters by three millimeters. Okay. So you can see here is one of those fibers that Lara talked about. Here we've got a little piece of plastic and here we've got another little piece of plastic. So all those things are teeny, teeny, tiny. They're smaller than most of our zooplankton, and they're even smaller than some of our phytoplankton. So how do you get this stuff better without removing everything that's living in that water? So we've got another survey question for you. What are you willing to do to reduce your contribution to the microplastic problem? So which of these actions would you be willing to take? And you can select more than one. All right, so given the high number of, of sort of votes on each of these, you can see that there are a lot of things that we can all be doing 
to help reduce our contribution to the microplastic problem that don't necessarily cost us anything. They're not necessarily difficult things to do. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the so what, the what we can do in these next slides. So as you saw, lots of things that we can do. One of the other things that we have been doing here in Florida for the last year is using citizen scientists to learn more about the microplastics in our local waters. So volunteers are going out around the state. They're collecting one liter water samples. Uh, we're asking them to collect just at the very surface of the water, and preferably on a calm day, because the theory is that we'll have more plastics floating at the surface when it's calm. When it's rough, they'll be mixed deeper into the water column. They bring those water samples into one of our locations where we have a, a filtration set up. They use those gridded filters. They filter their sample through, and then they observe their filters under a dissecting microscope. We're looking at 20 to 40 times magnification and using the grid to make sure that we don't double count anything and that we don't miss anything. And then the volunteers, if they have any questions, hopefully they ask one of their regional coordinators, one of us, to help verify things. But we do have some tools that they can use uh, to verify whether one of those little fibers is plastic or whether it's a natural fiber. And it involves using a, a hot needle. And we have a video on the Florida Microplastic Awareness Project website, which we're going to give you the, the link to here in a minute. Uh, that shows how to use that hot needle technique. So if anybody wants to try that out, you'll see how to do that. Once the volunteers are done collecting their data, they enter it online, and then I get all those data, and I put them into Excel, and then that Excel gets uploaded into Google Maps, and we have a, a map online that gets updated about every week to two weeks, depending on how many samples get turned in. Um, the colors of the pins denote the quantity of plastic that was found in the sample. So black pins had zero plastics, and then it goes blue is up to five pieces, orange is up to 10 pieces, I'm sorry, green is up to 10 pieces, orange is 11 to 20 pieces, and then red is more than 20 pieces of plastic per liter. So what are we finding? Um, we've had a lot of work done by a lot of volunteers. It's been a really awesome year. They've collected over 680 samples from more than 250 sites around the state. And basically what they found is that the vast majority of those one liter water samples contained at least one piece of plastic. And on average, they're finding eight pieces of plastic in a liter of water. As Laura mentioned earlier, most of that is fibers, 82%. 9% is being reported as fragments. So those would be the pieces of larger items that are broken down a small fraction of microbeads and an even smaller fraction of film, which is, I think, plastic bags, plastic wrap. So here's the website, uh, plasticaware.org. You can find all sorts of stuff about the project on that site. Uh, we have a pledge that we ask people to take, which has eight simple actions that we can all do to reduce our contribution to the plastic problem. Everything from saying no to drinking straws to using washable drink containers instead of takeaway containers, uh, disposable containers. A lot of things that are suggested are to try and reduce our use of single-use plastic items. But we also suggest that folks consider the fabrics that they are purchasing. Uh, this was brought home to me when I was uh, shopping for my son a couple of years ago when he was starting college, and we had to get twin extra-long sheets. And I discovered that I could find all sorts of twin extra long sheets that were made from microfiber, but I didn't want plastic sheets. I wanted cotton sheets, and I had to really search and actually pay a little bit more uh, to get those cotton sheets. We have had some good responses to this pledge. Uh, we've had almost 900 people take the pledge so far. A little over a third of those, a little less than half of those, have provided their email addresses so we could follow up with them afterwards. And in those follow-up surveys, we've had about a 25% response rate. And what we're finding is that, yes, people are willing to make these behavior changes. They're saying they'd be willing to make more than three of those behavior changes out of the eight that we suggest. And when we follow up with them, they're actually reporting making three behavior changes. So this is good. 
Uh, we need lots more people to become aware and to think about these changes. So with that, we wanted to leave time for questions. Um, here is our contact information, both for myself and for Lara. Uh, we've also put a link here that you're welcome to click on. And if you would like to go ahead and fill out the evaluation for the webinar now while you're online, you can do that using that link at the bottom. We will also be emailing that link out to you. And with that, I'm going to invite Lara back into the conversation. And we'll see what we have in the way of questions. OK, Maya, we had Dylan had a question about um, some of the research. He was asking um, if you could tell why fish would want to eat plastics instead of food in highly concentrated plastic waters. That's a great question. Um, I don't think we do know the answer to that. I would guess that. What happens if you, I don't know if you've ever played with styrofoam beads, but if you put them into water, they are right up at the surface and they tend to move to the side. If you had them in a dish or in a tank, they'll move to the side and kind of concentrate uh, around the edges of the dish. I guess there's a lot of um, sort of static involved with them. It may simply be that the fish see these objects clumped together and see it as being a more viable food source than having to go searching for the little things that are freely swimming around in the water. Um, it's all speculation, but that's the best guess that I can come up with. OK. And then we had a question from Joni asking if or are other states in, I'm assuming that stands for Gulf of Mexico, able to participate in this project with volunteers? Hopefully that is coming. Uh, there has been a proposal submitted to the Gulf of Mexico Alliance to start a Gulf-wide citizen science microplastics project that would be looking both at microplastics in water using the techniques that our project is using and also looking at microplastics in sand, floating out the plastics from the sand and, and examining them. So I'm not sure what the timeline is on hearing back on that proposal, but hopefully in the next few months, if it's going to be funded, we will hear about it. I know that the Sea Grant programs in the various Gulf states from Texas around to Florida will be involved if that is funded. Um, so that, that would be an avenue for you to, to pursue in your particular state. OK, and then Sean was asking, where can I find a list of materials required to conduct a microplastic study with high school aged students? For that, your best thing, the best suggestion I have for you is to email me. Um, I am more than happy to share with you the list of supplies that we purchased and, and talk with you about some other ideas for um, doing projects with high school students. I've done some beach sampling, looking at the sand with both high school and elementary students. Um, I actually need to get that part written up. Uh, we do have some protocols on the website for each sediment monitoring. Uh, but the supply list, I, I don't want to put it on the website and make it look like to the whole world that I'm endorsing just these companies and just these products. But I will send it out to you individually if you email me. OK, and then the next question. Um, if wastewater treatment plants are unable to filter microfibers, what is the incidence of microfibers in drinking water, or do we know? So we've had some volunteers test their tap water, and even bottled water, and we have found individual fibers in, say, a liter of water that was taken from the tap, or a liter of water that was from uh, a drinking, you know, bottled water. Um, what we don't know is whether that the plastics are coming through in the water or whether they're getting picked up as the water runs through the air as it's coming from the tap into the container. Um, but that is a great question, and it's one that, that probably hasn't really been investigated very much. OK, and then the next question, is there anything being done with storm drains so that more um, I guess, can be caught at street level. I see so many plastic water bottles in our drains. Yeah, that's, that's another really good question. I, I don't know, and I haven't really worked with any um, municipal stormwater folks 
to ask that question. I suspect that one of the challenges is not wanting to trap stuff up to the point where they would clog the storm drain and cause flooding. Um, so there's a, a bit of a trade-off there. I know that in some places they have gone to putting uh, big nets, like giant screens, out in the water body that the stormwater drains drain into to trap things there. Um, but at the drains themselves, I suspect there isn't much that they can do because of that risk of clogging the drain itself. Yeah, I know that there's also, I think they call them eels. You might have, they look like giant cylindrical things that sometimes they'll put in front of the storm drains to help trap um, debris and things from getting into the system. I don't know what the cleaning protocol is on that or if it's simply just a prevention and then it just yeah, those, continues to wash further down the road. Um, but I can definitely are, work into that. Those socks are typically used for sediment trapping. So they're they're filled with sand or something equivalent to that so that the water can get through, um, but they're often using construction areas to stop the, the dirt from getting through. But in a heavy rain, you will see that things back up and, and overflow. Okay, then there was another question about asking if there was instructions available for middle school age students to participate in doing a microplastics study. The protocols for the microplastic study are a little bit of a challenge, um, at least when it comes to the, the water. For middle school students, I would suggest doing beach sand, and I can, there is some information available on the plasticaware.org website under the get involved section of that website. Um, you'll see protocols there. But what you might be interested in are some curriculum materials that are available on the K-12 section of that website. Uh, my colleagues in Oregon, with Oregon Sea Grant, uh, just this summer published a microplastics curriculum that is geared for middle and high school students. Um, and so that gives a lot of background and activities and things to, to do with microplastics. Not necessarily doing the, the field quantification, um, but you can email me. I know you know my contact information. Um, and we can, we can talk more about that offline. OK. And I did want to mention Brian Neiman, my colleague here, um, about the street level garbage issue, said that in St. Pete they have baffle boxes that capture sediment, trash, and oils. But he said they're really, really expensive, and um, it becomes a maintenance issue. So I guess there are some options out there. Um, OK, and then the Harper family. So Connor, 12 years old, wants to know, how can we recycle quick dry clothing? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, the best thing in terms of, quote unquote, recycling clothing is to reuse. So if you have something that you've outgrown that you're not, you can't wear anymore, consider giving it to a thrift shop. Uh, selling at a yard sale. And similarly, if you're looking for clothing to wear, consider good used clothing uh, instead of necessarily buying stuff that has just been manufactured, especially with the, the synthetic clothing. I don't know. I know that there are some efforts around the world taking plastics of different types and turning them into things like running shoes or jackets or other jeans, you know, other clothing items. I don't know how possible it is to take our existing clothing and, and get them used in one of those projects. I haven't seen anything sort of promoting, uh, here, bring your clothes here and we will recycle them. Uh, so our best bet is to, to donate and hopefully somebody else can use something that you don't need to use anymore. OK, and then another question. Aside from taking the pledge, what other action items are you recommending? What do you recommend we do as individuals and anything else specific? OK, so the, the specific actions in the pledge itself, um, one is 
avoiding products that contain polyethylene, so that's personal care products. One is, a couple of these are the, the standard things that you're used to hearing, using paper or reusable shopping bags instead of single-use plastic, uh, bringing your own water bottle, preferably a washable container, instead of buying single-use plastic water bottles, bringing your own washable hot drink cup instead of using foam or plastic, uh, avoiding using plastic drinking straws. And I've had some people react to that and say, oh, but I have to use a straw for whatever health reason. And I need to point out to them that there are washable straws available. There are a surprising number. You can get glass straws. You can get metal straws. You can get washable plastic straws and make little straw brushes uh, to clean those out with. So that is an option if you need to have a straw uh, rather than one that you're going to throw away each time. A an idea that a friend suggested to me that, that I've adopted, bring foil or a washable container if you're going to a restaurant and think you might have takeout um, instead of using their takeout containers, which in Florida, at least a lot of the times, are styrofoam. Um, recycling is, is something we still recommend, although we are aware that there's not a huge market for recycling plastic uh, and that a lot of things that are put out for to be recycled, a lot of plastic items, do ultimately end up at the landfill simply because it's cheaper for companies to buy the raw nurdles than it is to buy the, the recyclable plastic, which is unfortunate. Um, and then the last thing we suggest in the pledge is the choosing natural fabrics rather than the synthetic fabrics um, when you can. So those are all the fairly simple, specific things that, that we suggest. It goes way beyond that. There's yeah, everything from balloons, yeah, not using balloons, not releasing balloons, certainly, um, to shopping at places where you can buy in bulk. Um, I've, I've actually started bringing my own cup to a restaurant that we go to uh, on the weekends. Uh, instead of using their styrofoam cups that they serve, they will fill my washable cup instead. So there are lots and lots of things, and there are lots and lots of you know, different websites that promote all sorts of, of really good options for reducing our plastic waste. Yeah, and I would say too, I mean, just, just being a model for other people, I've noticed, you know, I've, as I've started to do things, you know, people would be like, oh, like, where'd you get that? Or why are you doing that? And so, you know, people do pick up on it. And I think just being a role model for other people around you is a good step starts with one person right <laughs> so yeah lots of options there uh, and it looks like last question in the queue is uh, you mentioned microplastics entering a tap water sample potentially from the air given potential aerosol transmission of microplastics how if waste to energy plants example facilities that burn uh, garbage contribute to microplastics in the waterways yeah, I've had somebody else ask me about that, and, and this is another one of those things that I don't know for sure, but what I suspect is that they're probably not a big contributor to microplastics in the waterway simply because I would not expect plastic, small pieces of plastic to end up in the, the heat, waste, air-filled air coming out of those plants because the plastics themselves would melt. So it's probably more of a problem just us wearing a fleece jacket in the winter um, or shaking out you know, a microfiber cleaning rag um, than one of the waste-to-energy plants. Although there is, I, I had a couple of folks respond to the survey, um, to the, the pledge when I did the follow-up and say they're now much more conscious about where they sand or cut PVC. Um, there's so many sources for these small pieces of plastic that you don't think about until you start really thinking. Uh, it's a little bit scary. Okay, and I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. We want to respect everyone's time. It's almost one o'clock. Um, certainly, if you guys have any follow-up questions, you can contact Maya or myself, either by phone or email. Um, and again, we'll be sending an email out to everyone that registered for the webinar with a recording. Um, 
as well as, uh, again, a link to the survey in case you didn't get a chance to take it. Um, and we'll also include a link to the Plasticware website. I tried accessing that during the webinar. It looks like we might have had so many people trying to access it, it crashed. So uh -oh. it does work, but um, it doesn't appear, at least on my end right now, to be working. So just bear with us because um, there's a lot of great resources on there. And we will get those over to you. So thank you guys for tuning in and help us spread the word. Microplastic Awareness Month.